Our next speaker, Nick Vanzetti, is the Managing Director of ESL Australia. And he will then be joined by Michael Trotter and Dylan Poulos, who are two QUT students who are the initiators of esports competitions here at QUT. So let's welcome Nick and Michael and Dylan to the stage. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start just with a little bit of an exercise here just to gauge the room. I've got a lot of slides here that I might sort of skip through based on this uh, response. Who here would classify themselves or think that they know a little bit about esports already? Raise of hands. Not many. Okay, great. <laughs> My follow up question was going to be Did you know much about it, you know, five years ago? But I'm guessing the answer would also be no. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I won't bother with that one. But. Um, why I'm here essentially is while we're talking about disruptive influences is that um, as a general rule, you know, a lot of people think that disruption might happen overnight, um, but it can also take quite a different, uh, a long time and just nobody knows what's going on in the background and then it seems like an overnight sensation. And esports is, is kind of one of those uh, examples there. So what is esports? Essentially it's up there on your screen. It's um, essentially the term used for competitive uh, play, you know, particularly uh, for usually team-based games and what have you. And I just while I was sitting down, I wrote down some notes. I was looking at these stats, and I've seen these before. These are, are U.S. statistics, and it's about the average age of sports fans for certain uh, codes or, or sports, if you will. And in the last 10 years, the average age of a golf fan has gone up to 64 from the age of 59. Uh, tennis, 61, up from 56. Uh, the NFL was 50, up from 46. And an interesting percentage, only 9% of fans of the NFL are under 18. And the youngest sport in the US that's followed, the average sports age fan is 42, up from 40. And that's why I'm here, because obviously the average age of an esports fan is it's not in that realm, it's quite a lot younger. Um, and that's obviously helped fuel a lot of the growth of esports um, and that's essentially what we think we're trying to do is build the sport of the next generation. So just to show you where it's up to today, I've just got a video of our global companies, uh, some of our events from around the world. It's more than it's more, it's not just a competition, it's, it's the competition. This right now in the Spodek Arena is a moment that every player waits for the entire season long. So many game fives, so many losses, but not today! They're back, they're big, and they're Swedish. Welcome to the ESL National Championships. We've got some amazing action coming your way today. What a great time to be here in London. The crowd is already packed, ready for some fantastic Counter-Strike. I didn't believe it when they said it was sold out. I walked into the stadium and it was just ridiculous. So that's where we are today, but we weren't, we weren't always there at that point. Um, it was about 15 years ago when I was studying here, and the reason I sort of moved on so quickly was I was always very impatient, and I changed my career a, a few times. And I sin finally settled on, on making esports a reality because nothing was really being done about it. So in you know, the early 2000s, I was playing Halo uh, on the Xbox with a bunch of mates, and we'd have a couple of beers on a Friday evening, and we'd play um, four versus four, and eventually we stopped bringing the beer and we just wanted to play against each other just for the love of competition and the love of, of winning, and that's, um, that's why it's so similar to, to sport in itself. 
Um, so yeah, this is an example from the world's biggest game at the moment, League of Legends in 2011. This is their world championships. And um, I, I borrow this slide from our friends at Riot who, who wheel this out occasionally. You notice the, um, the tablecloths and the duct tape holding things up together. Um, but people still tuned in to watch it. There were 1.7 million unique viewers to watch this tournament uh, from around the world. And you fast forward five years, and they fill up the Staples Center in LA, um, and there are quite a few more people that were watching it. Uh, so these numbers are pretty crazy, uh, higher than the NBA Finals, uh, certain matches. So there's, it's here now, and it's, it's here to stay, and it's gonna continue uh, to grow, but that was a bit of an evolution. In terms of some numbers, I'm gonna go through these pretty fast, but if anybody wants to look at some of the stats, uh, Newzoo are offering um, I've done quite a lot of research on where esports is predicted to be in the future, um, predicted to be a, a multi-billion dollar industry in the next few years. Um, and the audience is, of course, growing with that, and that's what's fueling that financial growth. Uh, so where do we fit in? So ESL, building the sport of the next generation. Uh, I actually started my company uh, as a business here, not under ESL, but we essentially sold a controlling stake to ESL. And we had a few different offers on the table at the time. Um, rather than going with a, a Crown or a Channel 7 or a big media baron, etc., we chose to go with ESL because they truly got it and they've been around for 15 years. They're based out of Germany. They themselves have since been acquired by a, a media group at MTG in Sweden. And they're a truly gr global business who understand esports um, and um, authentic to creating a, what is the next sport. So just to talk about our sort of position in market, and I'll probably hang on this one a little bit because a lot of people are kind of confused about how the esports um, ecosystem works, and it can be quite um, complicated. Very similar to um, sport in the sense that we're organizing tournaments, we work with players and teams, and then a few different sporting codes uh, work with that in a different ways themselves. But we have this top layer, and on the top layer is um, the gaming publishers, and these are the gaming uh, developers who make the games. And when we first talk about a disruptive influence, we're now talking about esports disrupting entertainment properties, media, etc. But even esports itself disrupted the gaming industry about five years ago. Because if you look at the gaming industry um, and the commercializations of how games are sold, that has evolved a lot in the last uh, five to ten years. So, for example, I use an analogy here that, um, let's use Blizzard, for example, make some of the biggest games in the world. If they were uh, Cricket Australia, but they only wanted to sell bats, balls, stumps, and equipment, they didn't want to monetize the, the media rights or, or the, the ticketing and what have you of the other parts of the business. And what we were doing, esports organizers from around the world were organizing these tournaments with their games. They sort of fell into esports by accident almost. And then what happened um, with the commercial model for games, the number one selling game in the world right now, League of Legends, is completely free. You don't pay to, to, play that, uh, to buy that game, sorry, it's free, and there's a whole bunch of microtransactions. So every week the, the characters change, and to play that character that you just spent all week playing, you have to spend three bucks. But it's a lot easier to spend three bucks than it is to spend $100. So both models still exist. There are, there are guys selling the new release game every year, and it costs $100. But over time, in the last, uh, last three or four years, a lot of these gaming publishers have really seen the opportunity and the rise of esports, and that's one of the triggers for the growth of esports. So the publishers, who are now multi-billion dollar businesses, as opposed to uh, us much smaller organizers, are starting to pump a little bit of cash into esports and look after their own programs. So we sort of sit smack bang in the middle. We work as a service provider to these publishers and help them design and develop their own programs as well as creating our own events, which you saw in that showreel just before. Um, but I'll come back to this a little bit later, uh, because just to identify some of the trends of where it's going in the future, because it is a rapidly evolving industry. Um, so what we do at ESL, we organize big mega events that you saw in the stadiums. We do year-round activity um, and amateur tournaments. We have a bit of a product tree uh, right up from our tent pole events. Our lighthouse events are, are really designed as marketing tools, and I'll show you a video of uh, one we did here in Sydney uh, in a moment, and we go right down to the grassroots. And the bottom of the funnel is really where uh, the development in the future is gonna happen for esports as, as these things is gonna grow. Uh, so here in Australia, yeah, it was, a, it was quite a long journey. Um, I won't read too much into this, but essentially I started a grassroots 
business. It was more of a, a hobby business. I had 40 grand debt on my credit card. I traveled up and down the east coast of Australia uh, in, my, in my van that I had from film and television, and we did it for love. Um, but at one point I realized, wow, this thing is actually has huge potential. I'm gonna move myself to Sydney. My five best volunteers followed me down there. We started a company um, and we still didn't make it. But it wasn't until 2015 that we sort of sold up to, to ESL and we're now operating a joint venture. Um, so that kind of brings me to this, uh, this slide, which is you know, a big theme in our, our disruptive influences. It's been a while coming. And we sat in this rejected and neglected, we call it, phase <laughs> for quite some time. Um, but I'll come back to this in a little bit. Uh, so this was us in 2011. We mainly rented university halls in Melbourne, Sydney, and what have you. Um, pretty poxy, you'll notice some A4 media walls. Um, looks pretty poor, but we also had to invest in our own um, broadcast technology because Channel 7 and Channel 9 weren't running out to give us media rights uh, deals at that point. Um, I was on stage host talent. I was you know, interviewing players. I don't do that anymore. We hire, we have full-time talent that work for us. Um, and then we moved along. So I mentioned we still were too early for eSports, so we were a service provider to the uh, tech industry. Microsoft was a big client of ours. We did a lot of work with, um, with Xbox and anybody who would pay us to help them run some kind of gaming execution. We did a lot of project management. We built exhibition stands for League of Legends. And then we also did eSports on the side, either for those clients or on our own products. And then today, uh, we have our own studios in Sydney. Uh, we've done the live stream broadcast, not just for esports, but also popular poker tournaments like uh, the Aussie Millions. Um, we're renting TV trucks and doing broadcasts uh, at Luna Park in Sydney. This is a big one for Riot Games. Uh, we decided to put the analysis desk on top of the um, hot food store. And we had this cool opening shot of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Um, and then we took that same event down to uh, Margaret Court Arena in Melbourne, obviously, a famous sporting ground. And uh, it really picked up. We had a few thousand people there, but it was very much untested. And then if anyone recognizes this venue, it's South Bank Piazza. Did the same thing in 2016. And what I love about this one is uh, we put the analysis desk on the Brisbane River. And I was very proud. This is dodgy iPhone quality. Uh, but we also got the city to change the colors of the lights on the William Jolly Bridge to match our analysis desk. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, so now we're in a very fortunate position. We're number one uh, for esports in Australia, but you know competition is coming very fast. So I'll skip through a little bit of this. This is our team. Uh, we've got studios in Sydney. Uh, we can hold up to 200 people there, and we have different events for our publishers or for ourselves. Um, we've basically built our own TV studio again because no one else wanted to help us. Um, but then fast forward to this year, it was a big uh, moment for us because we ran our own tent pole event. We're like, okay, uh, maybe we can get a couple of thousand people in there. Let's try and get this global event down to, to Sydney. And we brought I Intel Extreme Masters. Um, and I've just got a one minute video to, to show the success of that. Essentially, we had 7,000 people there per day, um, over 8 million unique people watching online around the world. we are put on this show. So that was IEM. It was a big moment for us, but there's still a lot of work to be done here domestically. So how we got that big crowd in is we paid the, uh, we flew over the best gamers in the world from Brazil, Europe, uh, North America, etc. We had the highest prize pool of $200,000 US. Um, those players had to fly business class, by the way. It's very expensive. Um, 
but uh, the the Australian team didn't quite make it. They were uh, there's still a little bit of room to go there in terms of um, how good these players are in you know getting professional wages and high high prize pools, which uh, other markets are, are still achieving. But it was still a huge accomplishment. We only had seven weeks of sale time. Um, so we were selling tickets only for seven weeks because the final approvals uh, came pretty late. We had an exhibition hall, we had 19 exhibitors. It's a big partnership with uh, Intel, a long running partner of 12 years. Um, they had a, a massive booth in the middle of the foyer there. And it, uh, it attracted a lot of attention. We got a lot of mainstream press coverage, ABC News, Triple J, you can see the logos there. Um, and then we've sort of been victims of our own success because now everybody wants to get in on it. Um, but we're still trucking along and that's kind of where we are in terms of the market right now. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about the future and then how this uh, eSports has been disrupting. Um, I don't know why I keep pointing at the screen over there, but um, content challenges and opportunities. So some of the things that we've been doing a little bit differently to other sports and we've always had to do this. We, we talked a lot earlier in this, this morning about um, millennials and how unforgiving they are in terms of how they consume content and which ways they want to consume content. And we've had to be uh, on top of that curve. Um, so live instant social replays, a lot of sports are doing this really well right now. So Cricket Australia, Supercars, etc., are doing this, but we've been doing this for a long time. So the second uh, a really awesome play happens, we have to have that on social within a couple of minutes or, or it's forgotten or we're, we're criticised heavily. Um, so we've been broadcasting in VR, so we have a partnership with Sliver TV. So um, another big thing, we're, we're, we're very lucky in that we don't have to spend millions of dollars in mapping out the arena because the arena is digital. Um, so we can recreate that uh, through VR and, and we're cutting through that. But what does that mean for the future? So uh, we look at Australia's infrastructure in terms of internet and technology, and we've been a little bit behind the, the eight ball in terms of preparing for the future. So for us, um, earlier this year, we went out and spent oh, close to 100 grand, which is not a lot actually, considering how cheap broadcast technology is, on upgrading from 720p broadcast to 1080p broadcast. Um, now that seems like a pretty minor and trivial thing, and for a, a big media company, it's not a lot of money. But um, that is now the standard. But when you look at TV, it's a, lo a lot of TV sets are uneven in 720. So our audience will not accept anything less than, than 720. And in a year or two's time, they won't accept anything less than 720p. So where does that leave us in the future? And where is our infrastructure left to handle that? Um, broadcast encoding, you'll notice there I've got Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Um, so most of our media deals at the moment globally are, are, are with these sort of groups, not necessarily uh, traditional media and they have different formats and what have you. Um, we, our broadcasts have live feedback. So we broadcast on a platform called Twitch, which was acquired by Amazon for almost a billion dollars a couple of years ago. And they were uh, essentially the only provider for a long, long time. And now they're getting increasing competition from uh, companies like Facebook. But what the, all of these platforms have is instantaneous um, live feedback through chat. Uh, which is both a, a huge advantage and disadvantage at the same time. And there's something kind of new to the, the content and media industry in that if you have um, a few million people telling you that this is something about your broadcast or your content is just absolutely stinky, you need to change it, you need to change it. Um, which can be you know, a little bit heartbreaking sometimes when there are issues or technical problems, but it also creates great opportunities in that we can customize our content for what our audience wants and react on the fly which is very exciting and I think that uh, a lot of content creators will need to keep up with that in the future, uh, whether they be sports or any, anything else. And then looking into the future, so I'm going to go back to um, our market trends and talk a little bit about what's happening in esports in the future. And the first one is the increasing importance of esports for game publishers. So I mentioned that you know, five or six years ago, a lot of the game publishers, they only, they only cared about moving boxes every year or back to my analogy, the cricket balls, the stumps, and what have you. These guys have now recognized the potential of esports and want to further monetize off the back of that. Um, but it also means that they're investing heavily in, in catering to their audiences. The, the main reason that is, is because if they're not just moving boxes and there's microtransactions, esports is a great way to keep uh, their audience engaged and uh, it's very sticky. Um, so they're gonna reinvest back in the titles and ways to keep their audience um, spending money. 
Um, I'm going to skip this video. Soldiers. But that video was about Overwatch. So Blizzard, the perfect example is Blizzard have set up their own World League um, to buy a license. It costs you a cool 20 million bucks US. Um, we've had uh, numerous high stakeholder owners come in, like Robert Kraft, who owns the New England Patriots. Um, and that's kicking off at the beginning of next year. So that's very helpful. Uh, the second trend is traditional media companies entering the esports ecosystem. Now, the jury is still out on you know, how this all materializes, but the reality is that um, traditional media companies will need to continue to innovate and then serve digital platforms, not just through um, uh, traditional TV. A couple of examples of that, uh, Movista Esports has done a deal with us, ESL in Spain. Uh, they're Telefonica, they're one of the largest telcos. Uh, Turner in the US, our own uh, parent company, MTG. And then here in Australia, more local examples, uh, Seven Mate have created a, a gaming TV show that is on the digital platform. Um, and then they're also being quite smart about how they spread out their content. They have weekly uh, Facebook live streams, Twitch streams, YouTube content, uh, and they're across the whole gamut. And then we also have a, a new competitor. Our competitor is uh, HT&E, which are the rebrand of APN. They do a lot of the outdoor billboards, bus uh, shelters, and what have you, and they've announced their plans for esports. The other one is the professionalization of teams and players. Um, and this is probably most prolific in the media right now. When you look at esports, you're looking at all these uh, sporting bodies, clubs, etc., investing into esports, whether that's on an individual level like Shaquille O'Neal, uh, Jennifer Lopez, J-Lo, she's invested in uh, esports. Um, celebrities are getting into it. Um, Cleveland 76ers, I mean, there's so many, there's too many to list, um, but these guys are all believing in the future. And we talked about that aging uh, demographic of the average sports fan. The sports codes can see that and they're adapting accordingly. And the teams themselves are, are becoming uh, more savvy in how they market themselves and, and gain sponsorships. So there's a picture here of SK who won our tournament in Sydney, they're from Brazil. Their title sponsor was Visa. And SK have done a big deal in France, uh, or in Europe, sorry. Uh, they've brought on some uh, sports and, and brand marketing agencies to help them reach, um, reach those brands and monetize. And then the next ones are kind of uh, obvious, and I've talked about them already, so I won't dwell on them. But uh, there's intensified competition in the online distribution segment. So once upon a time, we only broadcast on Twitch. Then there's YouTube. Uh, these kind of companies, not your traditional media platforms, are vying for media rights. So this is the future. Um, not necessarily, uh, you know, we're not necessarily interested in doing a deal with Channel 10 or 7 or what have you if um, most of our audience aren't going to be on that platform anyway. When I moved to Sydney in 2012, none of my employees had an aerial. Um, we've got 26 permanent employees now. I think maybe one of them has an aerial. Nobody watches TV. They just don't do it. Um, that's the truth uh, from our audience anyway. And then obviously increased support from non-esports uh, brands or what we call non-endemics uh, from outside our space. Here in Australia it was St. George Bank, uh, Schnitz. Uh, I think I glossed over earlier. Did anyone know that Adelaide Crows had bought an esports team? No? There you go. Um, so then we go back to this slide and we're all of a sudden, we're, we're kind of accepted and cool and sexy almost. Um, but uh, that's because, <laughs> too far? All right, yeah, too far. <laughs> but you, you get where I'm going. It's becoming mainstream and it, it's very popular and that's obviously going to result in continued growth. Uh, one interesting anecdote here is just that the average revenue per user is uh, quite low in esports, um, which shows that there's a huge growth potential. Uh, things like uh, ticket revenues, uh, merchandise, etc., cetera, can, can show a huge amount of growth. Um, trends and predictions, I've talked about sporting codes already. Uh, NBA, the actual NBA, uh, have teamed up with the game developer who make the, their licensed products to run an official league in the States. Um, in the last few months, I've done a very similar presentation for Cricket Australia and the Big Bash guys. Uh, we've talked to AFL, NRL, uh, Supercars. We did a big uh, esports event up at Bathurst a couple of weeks ago. It was a bit of a test for them, but we're talking about 2018 already. So uh, we're going to be working a lot more with these guys. Um, and I think more interestingly to you know, disruptive influences, uh, looking at what's going to happen in the education uh, industry, new vocational changes, new careers and opportunities that are going to uh, flow up from the growth of uh, esports as an industry. And that can be in uh, things like sales, marketing, in uh, trying to harness uh, or bring across brand value uh, in, in the new age to this audience that we capture 
or it might be other things like um, uh, training, sports psychology, etc. Um, and there's a few new businesses and uh, with esports focuses popping up more about recreational facilities and this is going to continue to grow. I think that there's going to be more custom uh, esports arenas and training facilities set up in the country. Um, and there's an esports bar in Melbourne already. There's a few around the world. Um, so it, that's a no-brainer. I'm going to finish off with what I think is probably the, the biggest um, point about esports right now. We look at the increasing age of, of traditional sports fans. So by the way, yes, I'm a big um, Tottenham Hotspur fan myself. Watch every game. But... Um, <laughs> still a huge fan of esports, is that today, esports has been around almost 19 years. Now, there isn't a child today that in 15 years won't know what esports is. They may not necessarily be a fan, but that's just something to think about because everybody in the world at a child you know, who's 20 years old will know what esports is in that time. And that's going to be the changing face um, of that growth and development as the market expands because our kids are growing up as digital natives. Um, they understand gaming, and gaming is becoming far more accepted than it once used to be. Um, Minecraft is one example. Um, anybody here have kids who play Minecraft? Yeah, there we go. Some hands up, finally. Um, we ran a big Minecraft uh, show for Microsoft, Xbox, and Mojang, the developers, in the Opera House um, a couple of months ago. It was very popular. And, um, you know, that really opened my eyes because even myself, I, we cater very much to the 15 to 25 year olds, but the future is very much a lot of these kids uh, may get into, you know, more competitive outlets and, and transition into esports. And there's different titles and games and what have you, don't be too scared, it's not a bad thing. Um, they may not, but even if a small percentage of all those kids that play Minecraft look at esports in the future, then we've you know, multiplied our audience by a factor of, it's scary to think. Um, but yeah, there you go. So that's, that's eSports and how we're changing um, the future. You guys want to go? Cool. Hi. Um, so, uh, really proud to say that uh, QT is a thought leader in esports. Uh, we have uh, Australia's leading university esports program. But before I tell you guys a bit about what it is that QT esports does, I want to tell you about why it is we do what we do. Um, so, when I when I graduated high school as a 17 year old, I wasn't an academic student and I wasn't an athletic student, which doesn't leave much. Um, in fact, when I when I did graduate. <laughs> Not only did I not have um, an OP to get into university, um, I didn't really have much sense as to where I wanted to go. All I knew was is that after 3,000 games of, company, uh, of, um, of Command and Conquer, I had a 78% win ratio, which for me was huge, but it didn't mean anything to anyone else. And so that's, that's, uh, from that point, I didn't know what I wanted to do. My success in gaming didn't mean anything to myself. My parents were like, what are you doing? My, uh, my teacher's like, I'm oh, thank God he's gone. Um, so for, for me, the, the next step was kind of like, well, where, where does my life go? So for the next seven years after that, I, I did a whole bunch of stuff. And eventually, I found my way back to university um, to start studying psychology. And um, got into psychology and, and discovered that getting into sports psych was going to be really hard. So I thought, what, what can we get into? So we'll get into, get into gaming and try to apply my sports psych stuff there. And uh, we realized that there is a massive gaping hole in, in uh, this pathway for people who are coming up. For people like Nick was talking about, these students who are all playing, um, who are all playing Minecraft and want to go work out, well, how do I get involved in esports? What's the next step for me? Um, and so what we did is, is uh, we decided we were going to create a program for students to be able to find their way into this new emerging industry. So that's, that is what QT Esports is all about. So what we, what, we, uh, what we started with is a space. So we have a tiny uh, room downstairs in Xbox next door, which is an old converted uh, server room. It's very small, but we can fit in 40 students in there, no worries, and they're quite happy to get in there. 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., we have uh, social gaming. Students can come together, and they can uh, interact and um, get to know each other over a common love, something they're really, really passionate about. Um, and they do, every day. We see students uh, Monday to Friday come in and they get involved 
and they get excited, and then a lot of them go, you know what, this is great, but I want to get better at my video games. So they hang around, and after 4 p.m. every single day of the week, we have esports training. So we have students that are dedicating their afternoons, not getting paid a cent, to come in and teach fellow students how to get better at things like Overwatch, uh, like Nick talked about before, League of Legends, um, how to play Rocket League better. There's a whole bunch of different games that these guys come and get involved in. And it's, it's terrific to see them take up that challenge. Now, a lot of those students, they get involved, they get better at these games, and they love being in part of that community so much. They love being at QT so much. They go, I want to do more of this. I want to be more involved. So then what, what we do is uh, those students usually progress uh, on to helping us out with some tournaments. So recently, on October 7th, we ran our first major uh, esports um, competition where we had six teams, including a uh, team of um, six young 12-year-old kids from Redlands College who, uh, with one very overly enthusiastic um, parent, managed to rile up the school and has um, brought them in. And, and they competed. They got absolutely decimated, but they had an <laughs> absolutely fantastic time. And those students, when they walked away from that, went, wow, how can I get more involved in QT? And so what we're beginning to see now is that gaming is going to be a way for these students to come and to get involved in university. So we run all sorts of these kind of events, um, and they get an opportunity to test out their skills in event management and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, we also offer, uh, have a fantastic connection with ESL. ESL have been an amazing partner to us, and have provided a number of different opportunities for our students to be involved in um, uh, to be involved in uh, internship style stuff. So we went down and helped out with the IEM. This is not anywhere near as good a photo as what Nick showed before. This was taken off my, off my phone down at IEM. A number of our students went down to volunteer and help out. It was a great experience for all of us. It really um, increased our, uh, our love of esports and our dedication to want to be involved. Um, oops. So there, there are lots of other opportunities. We've been down to uh, EBX, um, and we've got some more opportunities for students that you'll find out a little bit from Dylan in just a moment. Um, so, but the, the last and the most important thing that we do is that we, we are kind of disrupting the educational opportunities here at QUT. So not only do QUT students come and they get a great uh, education here, we give them a way of applying that education to something that's practical, something they love and something that they can build on and in turn be more involved in the community. We've got students that go everywhere from science and engineering faculty all the way through to health and psychology. And these students can come in and they can apply um, their, their coursework and their knowledge that they're gaining into things like building our website, building the, uh, the advertisement boards that you'll see all over the university that are promoting uh, what Dylan's going to talk to you about in a minute. Uh, we've got psychology students that are coming in and helping to help uh, better our, our programs for training. We've got a marketing student who's running a whole team of marketing students to, to run our social media. This, this opportunity goes beyond just playing video games. It's beyond just running events. Our students are coming in and they're super passionate and they're finding a way to apply their coursework into something that's meaningful and it's going to give them a job once they graduate. We've got a number of students who have even managed to, through our program, get um, internships into uh, IT practices um, where they'll be able to take their, their course and jump straight into a job after they graduate. Anyway, I'm going to leave it over here to Dylan now to talk to you about the amazing opportunity that I'm hoping you guys will all take part in this afternoon in checking out our showcase that will be running after, the, after this event. Thank you. Uh, I don't really need it. So everyone's been alluding to this event that's happening this afternoon, and I hope I do it justice. Um, thanks, thanks, Mike and Nick. It is, it's super interesting to hear what's happening in the industry, both at QT and abroad. And luckily for anyone here today who's taken interest in anything that these two have had to say, you'll have the opportunity to experience it all tonight. QT Esports is hosting its Esports Showcase, and we want to highlight three main areas of esports, the community, the competition, and the experience of playing. So with the community, we've got six Brisbane-based organizations that will be setting up stalls. And this is super exciting because as the industry grows and, and like Nick keeps talking about, the competition comes, we expect some of these uh, companies to become major players in the esports industry. Later on in the evening, we've also got three guest industry speakers. We've got uh, Peter Souvlis. He's going to be speaking. He's the director of the Australian Esports Media Group, and he's going to be speaking about his experience from taking his knowledge and practice as being a pro player and turning that into running a successful esports organization. We've got Alyssa Latour and she's going to be speaking on the experience of esports from the perspective of a female athlete and talk a bit about how esports helped her find who she is. And lastly, we've got uh, QUT's very own Stuart Reisenwerber. He's going to be talking about his experience playing League of Legends internationally. Uh, moving into the, um, the experience side of it, and we'll have the opportunity tonight to not only play esports and experience that, Sorry, you guys will have that opportunity, but to also get a glimpse at the future of esports. We're going to have four stations set up for everyone to come and try, 
And some of those stations are going to be 1v1 stations. So for the more competitive amongst us, that is your opportunity to get a one-up over your mates. Looking forward to the future, as Nick alluded to, we've got VR. We've got a VR flight simulator and a racing simulator. And this is super exciting because what we're seeing is not only the, the VR streaming, but at least with the racing simulator, some prospective drivers are being picked and looked at by professional teams because of their track times in the simulator, not necessarily in real life. Um, and yeah, we're, we're getting that close to replicating the real thing. And it, it's really exciting. We're going to see VR play a massive role in the future of esports. But without a doubt, the centerpiece of tonight's performance is the live event. QT Esports is partnering with the Australian Esports Media Group to bring you two live matches here on campus. The professional team Atletico are on campus and ready to compete against QT's budding esports athletes. But there's a catch. To make sure the games are competitive, we're going to mix the teams. On each team, there will be two professionals, three QUT students, and one, uh, one random pick from the audience. <laughs> so <laughs> it's going to be absolutely insane. The live event is going to run from 4.30 to 5.30 in the Kindler Theatre, which is just a stone's throw away from the networking event in Old Government House following today's conference. Um, Real World Futures attendees have a VIP section at the front. It's all cordoned off just for you guys. And there's a VIP entrance to the right side of the theatre, so you guys can come in and out as you like. Um, it's going to be absolutely incredible, and we really hope to see you all there. Just before we move off into question time and a video that I have to play, I really want to thank um, Nick Vanzetti. He's come up to Sydney, and um, he's speaking on behalf of eSports today. We couldn't do what we're doing at QUT without guys like Nick pushing the industry forward. And we really want to thank David Fagan for giving eSports this forum. Um, yeah, so I have a video now. Atletico are coming to QUT Gardens Point to take on Brizzy's best eSports athletes. Grab a seat in the Kindler Theatre and watch the Battle Royale unfold, commentated by Peter Souvlis and Gordon Wyeth. And if you think you've got the skills to take on Atletico, you can. Two audience members will be selected to play in each round. After the match, check out our guest speakers and have a walk through our eSports Expo featuring VR demos, Smash Brothers 4, and more. It's all happening at The Q, Tuesday the 17th of October, 4 p.m. For tickets, head to the QUT Esports Facebook page and hurry, they're selling fast. We'll see you there. Thanks, guys. Cheers. What a lovely gentleman. He asked me if I wanted a seat. Um, how exciting is that? Who thought they were going to learn about esports today? Yeah, um, we only ha we have seven minutes for questions, so that's probably one or two questions. Who would like to start? One over here. Who's, who wants the second one? Oh, you've had two questions already. Who else? Yep, down the front here. Okay. I, I was interested. Is, is there a drug code in esport, or is an e drug code? <laughs> Sorry, so the question was, is there a drug code? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, interesting. So there is actually a new body called the Esports Integrity Commission. It's run by a guy called Ian Smith, who used to work with the uh, international, um, what's the cricket body? <laughs> yes, correct. Um, <laughs> so if we're going down this line, there, there is, so in terms of uh, concerns with um, performance enhancing drugs, it's Ritalin. So, or the ADHD drugs, which provide you with better concentration for your games. Um, so at ESL, we take that very seriously. So we had an anti-doping room at our IEM Sydney event. So uh, yeah, there, there is a code um, and it is in force. Great question. Our next one's down here. Might be cheeky. <laughs> Hi guys, thank you very much. Um, Nick. The question I have for you, if you don't mind not saying what Mike and Dylan are doing now, I, I'm really curious if you were to go back to university and change one thing, what would you have designed differently? And you can't say, I want, I want the esports program that QUT has. <laughs> Do you mean in terms of course structure or? Anything, anything. the shape, Your the life. size, the flexibility, um, anything at all, not the refec. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a Tough one. I actually really did enjoy my uni times, um, but I suppose when we're talking about disruptive influences, always having a very open mind to the new industries that are popping up 
and vocational opportunities that may not fit the traditional mould. And I suppose that's uh, more important now more than ever um, in looking at trying to provide, even if it's just elective courses available to students, to be able to try and sub try something slightly outside what they, their course studies might be, even if that's expanding electives um, beyond the coursework. Okay, we do have time for the question here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, Renee from St Paul's School. Um, I had a recent experience actually with my 70-year-old mother-in-law. Uh, my teenage nephew actually phoned me and said, you're not going to believe it, I got onto Lynn's phone and she's number 25 in Australia for Candy Crush. Can you believe that? And Lynn sort of turned around and went, what are you talking about? And so now no one is allowed to touch Lynn's phone, no one is allowed to open Candy Crush because she wants to maintain that status. Excellent. So she's 70 years old and I'm, I'm thinking about scalability. So you've, we looked at the audience today, we can see the demographics that you're aimed at. Have you got a strategy in terms of scalability to around, around our ageing population and getting them involved? Uh, it's interesting because mobile esports is something that's picking up uh, fairly quickly. I'm not sure if there's Candy Crush tournaments yet. Um, <laughs> but we have actually done some work with uh, Clash of Clash of Clans and uh, some of those kind of games and Supercell are investing in various esports tournaments. So uh, I think primarily we're not rushing out to invest ourselves in these kind of platforms, but we obviously recognise that there is a future in mobile esports, particularly in Southeast Asia where a lot of the population who are involved in esports will actually either attend a net cafe because they can't afford a PC themselves, but everyone has a mobile phone. So um, mobile esports is definitely on the rise. I must confess, my son's got me into Clash of Clans and I had to delete the app from my phone because I was getting too addicted to it. <laughs> it's slippery slope. Yeah, I look, uh, okay, we'll get a microphone to this gentleman and I'm going to ask a controversial question of you, Nick. I looked at your team photo and I couldn't see any ladies in there. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Where are they? Uh, it's interesting. So we have three females who work in the office. Um, and we're a fairly small team and we started as a very small team and the reality was that um, uh, we built off the people who are already working within our ecosystem and we've been trying to expand upon that. Um, so the, the, the three girls that work in our office are, are finance related um, and content creators um, at the moment. So, But uh, anybody can do the kind of work that we do. So most of the work we do is a mixture between broadcast uh, production uh, because we do our own production and project management which anyone can do, but I think that there hasn't been, it's probably a legacy issue to be honest, in that there hasn't been as many to choose from. And at the end of the day, we'll always just choose the best applicant. So while we are definitely trying to diversify, uh, it has been a, a slow process. Okay, with some, something to keep an eye on for the future. Um, yes, our question from the back, and this will just, be our last one. Yeah, just two questions. Who's Pooter Pie? And second question is, I've heard that South Koreans are the best at gaming. Can you tell us why? Was the first one about PewDiePie? Yeah. That you guys can take that one. Oh, I don't really want to talk about PewDiePie. Uh, <laughs> so, no, uh, he's, a, he's a Swedish uh, YouTuber from what I understand. I, to be perfectly honest, don't watch a lot of his content, but um, I think he's a really good representation of um, how, at the moment, uh, people tend to get found in esports um, because there isn't much of a pathway into esports professionally at the moment. A lot of people um, who jump on and create a lot of content from either uh, casting their own matches, uh, putting their own content up, that's how they get their viewership. And, and PewDiePie, I think, is the uh, probably one of the best in the world at doing that. He's got a massive following of people. I'm not sure it's all around gaming, um, but yeah, yeah, so that's kind of what he does. What was the second half of the question? It's about career, right? Um, yeah, I think career just so far ahead. You know, they're, they're slightly um, insulated uh, country in how they do things, and they adopted esports very early. So 20 years ago, um, they were playing esports. It was on television, um, and it, was, it re received mainstream acceptance. So they're so far ahead. Also, there's an infrastructure issue there. They have some of the fastest broadband speeds in the world. Um, but I, I truly believe that we have the capability to grow, not at the level of perhaps Korea, um, but as those improvements and acceptance uh, becomes, you know, more mainstream. Why I do have a theory, though. Some of the best esports teams are from very uh, cold climates, like uh, Scandinavia, Korea, yeah. etc. The weather's too bloody good here. Yeah. <laughs> we exactly. can go outside and do a few different things, but it's all about balance. And um, a, a lot of our gamers are interested in both sport and esports. Thank you. Now, um, gentlemen, how would you like to? choose the random people from the audience. Are, are all our names in a 
bucket already or would you like us to come and see you in the lunch break if we're interested in competing? Uh, if anyone's definitely, if anyone's got a burning desire, um, come and have a chat with us for sure. Um, we can definitely got arrange one, that. Okay. Definitely arrange that. Um, <laughs> um, Excellent. Uh, otherwise, it'll be um, just through banter with the guys that are doing the casting. But if, if you have a burning desire, please come have a chat with me and we'll, we'll um, get you up there. Oh, we've got two like, females hands up. Hands. There we I, go. I would just say, if we can, I would encourage uh, anyone obviously to come down to the session uh, later on. Obviously, we're going straight into lunch at the moment. So if anyone does have any further questions for us here as a group, we're happy to answer them. Thank you. Well, look, please join me in thanking uh, Nick, Michael and Dylan.